Hi, Eric. Hi, Aaron. Hey, so um, let's get good. Let's get into it. Let's just jump right in. Both let's feet. Let's do it. That's <laughs> Today, the total number of feet that we have. Let's yes. put all of them directly into the pie. Yeah, into the pie. Um, what are we talking about? Broadcasting. Broadcasting. Yes. Um, I read this chapter from David O'McKay, The Rise of Modern Mormonism. And then you um, immediately sent me an email saying it was boring with, I think, six or seven O's. Yeah, boring. <laughs> Listen, I love this book. Every chapter I've read in it so far has been riveting. Um, but not this one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gregory Prince or WM Robert Wright, if you're listening, I really do admire your work, and I hope you make more of these. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it was good in the sense of, you know, it's good history, right? It's a good record of how the church did something absolutely revolutionary and amazing. But um, that was 60 years ago. What happened? They made Bonneville Communications, while. right? That's the big deal. Bonneville Communications came out of this chapter. Spoilers, that's skipping to the end. They bought a bunch of networks and they um, kind of did a bunch of broadcasting. They lost a lot of money. They tried to get into shortwave radio, which I, I don't even know what that is. I did. I had no idea that shortwave was supposed to be the next broadcast medium. That, that did not catch on. It really didn't. Why didn't it? Oh, man, these are expensive. They are expensive. Uh, but the idea is with shortwave, um, you can talk to people halfway around the world, which sounds mm -hmm. like a great idea. I mean, with KSL, which the church owns, was the first... Um, the first broadcast outlet they bought, their AM station. Uh, I could pick up at night when, um, is the ionosphere? You're the scientist. I know you're not an atmospheric scientist, but I expect- Ionosphere is above the earth. Right. Well, well, so AM radio bounces off one level of the atmosphere that goes higher at night than it is in the day. I think it's the ionosphere. I could have checked, but I didn't check. Yeah. You know, people can Wikipedia it themselves. It's, That's it's right. It's easy for them as it is for me. Anyway, <laughs> but the point is AM travels farther at night than it does at day because this layer of the atmosphere bounces off is higher in the sky at night than it is in the day. That's the point. That's, that's kind of rad. And I can pick up KSL in parts of California, depending on the weather. Mm -hmm. um, even though I left Utah in 2004, I have left KSL on my AM presets because there aren't that many good AM radio stations anyway. <laughs> Yeah, what, what do you have you got if you don't want to listen to sports or yeah, or, or NPR. Rush Limbaugh what are you gonna what are you gonna listen to on am um it, with when I bought a new car I put KSL on there just because I'm curious if I happen to be out driving around at 2 a.m can I pick up Salt Lake City and it's not like the news in, like, on KSL is so much more relevant to me I could switch to FM and listen to KQED but um I'm just I'm just super interested in and I find KSL's 50,000 watts fascinating. Oh, speaking of things that were weird, as I was re-looking at the chapter this afternoon, it's bizarre to me that the church changed the, the signal letters from KZN to KSL. Like it was already Zion. Why would they change it to Salt Lake? <laughs> I, that's such a peculiar choice. I don't understand it. I actually didn't put it together that it was Zion. K K Z Zion. Yeah, I don't think I put it together when I read the chapter the first time. But. Sorry, I accidentally used the Matrix pronunciation there. <laughs> have you been watching movies? Wait, I thought you haven't seen that movie. I have seen the Matrix. No R-rated movies. This is one of the few rated R movies I've actually seen. Okay. Um, one of like four. Although our, I have to tell you that my wheel is crumbling. <laughs> what, every what is, time, what's weakening you now? What is every time I temptation? Every time I flip on Hulu and see Deadpool. <laughs> yeah, you told me in a previous episode. For people who are new here, you can go. I don't know which episode it was. Probably the the Word of Wisdom uh, Commandments are Squishy episode. That Deadpool would be the thing that eventually breaks you. Yeah, it looks. Which so is great. funny because Deadpool, like I. I bet it's funny, but like, I just don't want to watch it. Sure, it's real juvenile. That yeah. or Zombieland. Anyway, so the church bought all this equipment, and it's like they tried first to just be a networking company, right? Yeah. To own and operate a networking company to like, somehow they well, thought the that they could make content and own the equipment and everybody would love it. And it kind of worked in some parts of the country. Yeah, but this is when. TV sucked, right? Right. Like I, that's kind of what I was getting back to. What kind of content did they put on in the 50s 
that actually made them money? I was the the words unofficial film group uh, talked about La Strada, the 1954 Fellini movie this week, which wasn't good. I'm going to get controversial right now and say, like, <laughs> I don't like Fellini. I just don't think he's good, um, which now all the snobs in the audience are upset. Um, Usually I'm the one like saying the snobby things, but I don't like Fellini. Anyway, um, w- some of the older members of the ward who are, who are in the unofficial film group were talking about when their television was the size of a smartphone. Well, not the television. The television was the size of a room, but the screen was the size of a smartphone yeah. and it was a circle. And, and I didn't know this was a real thing. I'd seen this in movies, but I thought it was a joke. Um, they literally did have a magnifying glass that attached to their television that you'd put in front of the screen so the whole family could watch it instead of just one person like sitting directly in front of it staring at the screen. <laughs> and and I remember a story of my dad uh, of my dad's that would take place during this time when he lived he lived in Nephi, Utah, and a and a friend got the first color t- television in Nephi, and he went over, but the TV shows were just sort of like blue tinted or green tinted because there was no actual color programming. So it was just black and white, but it was a little, little colored just because of the machine. Uh-huh. Um, and then I also remember there's a terrific film, which I saw because of the unofficial film club called An Honest Liar. It's a documentary from six or seven years ago. Um, it's actually really good for maybe for a future season. We talk about this because it could be super interesting in terms of like talking about religion. Okay. Um, it's about a magician, but uh, it starts with a clip from when he was on television, very and very early in television. And it's literally just a bare soundstage. And there's a lady singing a song and he's suspended in his straight jacket from the ceiling and getting out. And like, there, it is so bare bones. Like TV ha- was not good at the beginning. Oh, well, that makes a bit more sense to me. I mean, maybe they did some awesome stuff, but it didn't seem like it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I didn't understand how they could have. I mean, they had a but couple they did of- make it work. Eventually, once they hired the right people. Yeah, that was um, cool. That's one of the lessons here. And this is a lesson the church has learned that you need to hire the best people. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that's talked about later in the, uh, in, the art, in, the, in the chapter, one of the things that's talked about later in the chapter is the Homefront series, which began right after President McKay passed away, but was an outgrowth of what he'd been working on. Do you remember watching the Homefront commercials nope. or something on TV? You don't? Aaron, we're the same generation. Like, I know, I don't know how many it wasn't, times they didn't make it to Oregon. I, I don't. Well, yeah, but I don't know how many times I went to Sunday school in Clovis, California, and the teacher would just say, "Let's watch Homefront." We'd be all like, "Yeah," we'd just watch a VHS tape of Homefront commercials from the seventies and eighties. They won like, all the awards. Peabody's. They won so many awards, Emmys. Uh, they won an award at Cannes. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, and they're they're good. They hold up. I actually completely coincidentally bumped into an article from a 2012 New Yorker about the home front ads and how good they were. Sweet. So the New Yorker in 2012 was talking about them and the New Yorker also kind of like, man, these new I'm a Mormon commercials seem a little desperate compared to how good the home front <laughs> ads were. Um, well, I mean, that sounds great. Um, well, now we're getting to kind of the stuff I wanted to talk about. Which I am excited about. I don't know what you want to talk about, so let's hear about it. Well, I just want to talk about social media in general. Well, that's, I think, the really interesting thing, right, is how does President McKay's ambition in broadcasting lead to the world we're in now? Because, like, you and I are not broadcasting right now, right? We're we're narrow casting. Ooh. So, like, the seven um, people who pay attention to us and the six people who pay attention to us in a very distracted way and don't actually remember anything we say uh, <laughs> those 13 people they are the ones we're talking to actually i have no idea you haven't shown me stats in since before the pandemic so i actually have no idea how many people are listening maybe it's a great secret you don't have millions to millions oh well maybe we are a broadcaster then at this point nope. i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're you're just thinking fourth dimensionally as doc brown would want us to do uh, great. Eventually, given enough hundreds of years, millions of people will hear this episode. Ah, fantastic. Yeah. Um, the church started this broadcasting. David O. McKay was really into it, really wanted to get it done. We had our first general conferences broadcast, um, and we've done it every year. And I remember growing up how excited everybody was during general conference. They said, 
we have the technology to reach all these people. We have these huge satellites. And looking back at it, I realized they were all pretty old already, <laughs> people that were saying it. So, yeah. And this was in the, you know, in the 80s. And so these are the people who were born in a time where this didn't exist and they got to watch it all appear, right? Right. Uh, here's, here's a line from the book. The April 1962 General Conference was carried by 52 television stations, the first time the conference had been broadcast coast to coast. That's right. Yeah. And um, General Conference, um, if you've never attended, is still one of my favorite things, my favorite two things that happened in the year, the other being the other General Conference <laughs> twice a year. <laughs> I still love them, and I can't wait for them to happen. And I really am grateful for this part of the church. I think general conference is great. You know, can I, can I talk about something that really irritated me? Yes. Um, so if not here, where Eric? Exactly. And this is totally relevant. So um, when I moved to the Bay area, Bonifield communications still owned a radio station in the Bay area. Oh. They owned the, they owned the local classical music station. And twice a year we would get general conference. Um, which was great because with my FM radio, I could listen to April session while my kids played little league games. And um, I was really, really annoyed when the church sold that station uh -huh. it was because a lot of what, a lot of the accumulation that we see beginning in David O. McKay and the rise of modern Mormonism has been dismantled. Um, a lot of it is divested. Not, divested. Okay. That's, that's a, <laughs> that's a more business friendly way to say it. Um, but I mean, it, I suppose it's not necessary now because we have um, the internet. Okay. But so, yeah. I am a strange person, Aaron. I don't, I don't have a smartphone, so I still can't listen to. General every time Conference you say this, game. every time you tell me this that you don't have a smartphone, I don't believe you. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I don't even have a dumb phone, right? Like I am so, and this is this is a very conscious decision, but it's it means that I can't listen to General Conference at the ball game. I love my the phone. Church has failed me. That's all there is to say. Um, you and I are answering machine generation. That's true. Okay, so we have our feet really in, just like these folks that we were just discussing had their feet in radio versus color television versus you know, satellite TV, right? So some of them predated that. <laughs> yeah, right. We have our feet in the um, television is whatever's on, and we have to record an answering machine message. Yeah. And um, by the way, my answering machine message, the best one I ever had was leave your name, number, and credit card information after the beep. <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> Once. <laughs> Oh my, my elders gosh. quorum president left a message <laughs> and he left his credit card number on the on the thing. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> I never used it, of course, but I thought it was so funny that yeah. someone that and he was the nicest guy. He was like, you know what? <laughs> this is funny. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> that's fabulous. Anyway, but yeah, now we have the internet. Um and we hey, have social you know, media. And yes. I was just gonna say relevant, relevant fact. Um Something that was pointed out to me earlier, I, I think this was might have been last week, um, is if Ezra Taft Benson had just lived six years longer, zero of the presidents of the church during the 20th century would have been born in the 20th century. Wow, that's a cool stat. I mean, that's that's how old these guys are, right? Mm -hmm. Um so and they're only gonna they're only gonna last longer as time goes on. Be an example of the believers, said Mary Ann Cook in 2010. Here's what I thought would be fun to talk about. And maybe okay. you have other stuff that you want to talk about, but I want to talk about the contrast between the messaging of the church in 2010 and mm -hmm. the messaging of the church in 2020. Okay. I, th I think that there's a contrast. I think it's interesting. And I don't think it's the fault of anybody, but I do think that there's been a change in messaging. And I think it's, it's I think, it's, like I said, I think it's fun. I went and I looked on the corpus, that fancy. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the general conference corpus. That's right. That is a <laughs> super useful tool. So we actually had a fireside here on social media, and one of our panelists talked about this corpus as well. So it's a very useful tool. 
And they did the same thing that I did. Look at how many instances of the word social media have been mm -hmm. in general conference talks and just try to get a sense as to whether it was in a positive or negative way, right? Yeah. And, um, and a lot of them read like this quote here, right? And this is a good quote. Like it's valuable. It's a valuable lesson. We must take care that the media we invite into our homes does not dull the sensitive sensitivity to the spirit, harm relationships with a family or friends, or reveal priorities, personal priorities that are inconsistent with gospel principles. By example, we can help our children understand that spending long periods of time using the internet, social media, and cell phones, playing video games, or watching television keeps us from productive activities and valuable interactions with others. Okay? Yeah. This, this um, I'm, I'm singling out this quote, not because I think that she, Marianne Cook was, you know, same thing that was wrong, but that this was something that we've heard again and again from general conference talks, right, over the last seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years, which is be careful with social media and don't use it too much. Yeah, we've seen uh, this, the prescribed social media fast shrink, right? Um, when they come up to the point now where instead of being asked to fast, we're being asked to like get on social media and light the world or um, give thanks. Yeah. Let's talk about the give thanks campaign. Let's um, do it. President Nelson had this wonderful thing that happened over this Thanksgiving in the middle of the pandemic when he asked everybody to get on social media and just say what you're thankful for. Right? Yeah. And it was great. I don't have any, I'm not trying to criticize anything here or to, to say that, but I think something's changed. I think, I think that there's a, there's a difference in attitude in the church towards social media. And I think oh, it's, sure. and I think it's, uh, there's, it's been a change over the last 10 years and this pandemic has heightened it to a core, to a, to a, to a knife, to a, a point, to a, it to a point, enzyme peak, it heightened it to a, Apple core. <laughs> Listen to this quote from one of our local church uh, stake leaderships about um, social media and missionary work. Social media is not something cute that just keeps the missionaries busy until they get back to normal proselyting work. Right? In other yeah. words, the, the church is really kind of zeroed in. But one of the best ways that they can share the gospel is through social media. So we talked a bit about this last and during our last episode, but since we were doing broadcasting, I thought I'd talk about it here again, um, that, the, that the attitude seems to be shifting. It's so funny when I read this quote from Sister Cook, um, watching, you know, social media, cell phones, playing video games, watching television keeps us from productive activities invaluable interactions with others. During this pandemic, that's been the only kind of interaction, right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> this quote just doesn't work in, you know, in 20, the first part of 2021 and 2020, at least yeah. in the Bay, at least in the Bay Area. No, the, I mean, the nature of reality has changed fundamentally and permanently. Um, and I don't mean that as some sort of hyperbolic exaggeration. Like you and I are talking over Zoom right now, which simply was laughably not part of reality when we were teenagers. That's right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, rem I remember taking um, screen grabs of Star Trek Next Generation episode in like the late 90s that we had somehow, because my dad was on the forefront of all this stuff. Uh huh. Right. And I just was, and somehow I had this episode of Star Trek and taking screen grabs of it and just saving it to my computer and just looking at it and going, wow, this is just the most amazing thing, right? And now it's just, everything is there and I don't even want to look at it. <laughs> yeah. I've seen all that Star Trek. Give me something. The fire hose. <laughs> okay, so I love it. I love this kind of embracing of social media because I'll tell you, I think that there's lots of people in the church that took these messages from the late 2000s, early 2010s. And I think they're just, um, they kind of don't want to have anything to do with social media. How many people have you heard that they've said, I've canceled my Facebook page? 
Oh, sure. I mean, but Facebook's awful, so who can blame them? Yes. Uh, but like when I was, I think I may have mentioned this when we were talking about social media last time, but after the stake social media fireside, which I watched when I was visiting my parents, um, yes, a pandemic visit, but uh, we had been isolating both of us beforehand. Excellent. Um, but my parents afterwards said, what social media should we get on? And we decided after some discussion, my wife and I, and discussing with my parents, we decided that Instagram would, was probably best. Yeah, and okay. my bet is they have not been on Instagram since because it's just not a natural place for them to live. Um, but the fact that my parents who spent most of their adult life getting their children off of um, whatever screen uh, signed up for an Instagram account to help the kingdom of God is like, that's, that's an enormous shift. I will say like, we're, I think we're still in the very awkward early stages of figuring this out though. Um, for all the good things about Give Thanks and Light the World, they still have a very, um, they often, I should say, have a performative aspect, especially when they happen all at once and uh, people's motivations vary ever so slightly and people's ways of reading these things vary ever so slightly. And so um, it's complicated, right? We're figuring out how to do this in a way that is natural, just like how uh, Homefront was successful. Um, and then this particular writer in the New Yorker thinks that uh, the I am a Mormon campaign was awkward and trying to do like felt felt a little nerdy. Yeah, we're, said, we're figuring um, out how these things work. This uh, article says, is called the rise and fall of the Mormon TV commercial. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Julie through the glass. I'm not sure what Julie refers to here. Uh, it's it's one of the characters in one of the um, commercials. You should spend an hour on YouTube after this is over, just watching Homefront commercials. Okay. There's some great ones. Like my favorite one is the the boy and he, little boy. He's like maybe three and he starts crying. He's like I'm trying and it's heartbreaking every time. And here's a secret for you. The way they got that performance from the kid was the director yelled at him for not doing it right. And he cried and said, I'm trying. Oh, that's a real, uh, come on, I'm gonna be artsy for a second. That's a real, <laughs> um, the guy who directed The Shining. Oh, Kubrick. I that's just a real read Kubrick an, moment. I just read an article about Kubrick and how like, devastating it was for Shelley Duvall to have to spend like nine months of her life just crying all day long every day that poor woman um but I it has been a, a, a hard contrast to sometimes listen to um to be someone who loves the internet so much and have it and hear in the past conference talks which which would make you a, like nervous about going anywhere near it, right? So I know that that wasn't their intention, but a lot of sometimes that's the message I think that came through. And um, the message that they usually tried to emphasize was everything in moderation. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people heard, don't do this at all. Well, and that's not so far from what they were saying, and it's not so far from what we've been trained, and it's not so far from a really human religious impulse. I mean, Jesus is always knocking the Pharisees for taking things farther than they need to go. Like, keep the Sabbath day holy. Okay, you can take 12 steps. Um, that is a natural human tendency. If you're trying to do what God wants, and you really love God, and then uh, God asks you to do something, and then you take it too far, because you're so focused. Like if God, you know, wants me to do this, what if I, what if I don't do these 17 things that are related as well? Um, it's, it's a, it's a really real risk for a religious person to take a commandment and turn it, that one commandment into, you know, uh, we've seen this a lot. And this is, uh, do you remember, of course you remember, uh, in the nineties when president Hinckley was on 60 minutes. That's and amazing. One of the things Mike Wallace said, well, what do you say to people who say, this is a gerontocracy, this is a church run by old men? And President Hinckley's answer was, it's wonderful, isn't it, to have someone steady at the helm who's not blown about by every wind of doctrine? But Mike Wallace wasn't wrong that that's a legitimate concern. When you have people who say, like, don't spend so much time on the internet, and there are people whose literal job is to be on the internet, and there are people whose literal social life is on the internet, um, it, it was a time where it felt like they didn't understand the world that people were living in. It's sort of like if General Conference was being 
broadcast to the saints on Mars. And the guys on earth were saying like, you see these photos of people like jumping around and they're like gravity, like, you know, that's not, that's not the way we do things. And like, what is a Martian saint supposed to do? <laughs> gravity is less than it is on earth. I can't help it that my steps are a little longer. Like, I feel like you don't see me here on Mars. I think that the pandemic really sharpened this. I think that this is going to be a fundamental change in the way church does its business. Uh, there's going to be the, I think there's going to, there's over the last year, I think there's been a real embracing of um, social media. And I think yeah. it's for the, I think it's good. Um, I think it was, I hate the pandemic. <laughs> and I hate it when people try to say, but the pandemic was good yeah. because. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we, we at Face and Hat are strictly on the record as being anti-pandemic. I would have rather not had a pandemic, just had the church yeah. change along with everybody else. That would have been better. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's frustrating because um, we do believe in modern revelation. And I think part of what we as saints want to believe is that we're always a little bit ahead of the world. But the evidence doesn't always back that up. <laughs> <laughs> in some ways, but other ways. In some no. ways, yes. In some ways, yes. But I mean, um, I mean, in our next episode, we're going to be talking about the 1978 revelation. It's really hard to say we were on the cutting edge of like racial yeah. equality. Yeah. I mean, if we could have been, we were in the 1830s, but then we we lost our way. But that's yeah. another episode. Um, let's talk. There is an elephant in this room that I'd like to talk about. I think that the church. Um, I think it's good to be more, I think social media is a fine thing. I think the internet is one of my favorite things in the world. I'm trying harder and harder to be LDS online myself. Um, but there, as you said earlier, can, you said Facebook is terrible. Can you please elaborate? So I have a Facebook account. Um, I was never that interested in Facebook. I got Facebook a long time ago, over a decade ago, I think. Um, because I am a longtime subscriber to Wired Magazine, and on the cover, uh, there was a, a uh, life-size image of Zuckerberg's face, and the article talked about Facebook and why it was important and what, what was happening and how it was changing society. I was like, I guess I better get an account. So I got on Facebook. Um, and Facebook, I think, is really great at a couple things. Um, it's really great at being my Rolodex. Basically, everyone I've ever known that I have any connection with today, I am connected to on Facebook, and I could go there to find them if I really had to. But I've, and I've had a few great interactions. Um, there's a Mormon poets group that I've had really good interactions with. Um, and I've had some good conversations with family and friends, mostly in Messenger, not publicly. But I've also had some awful experiences, not as bad as most people. Uh, but I've had like, former students who turned white supremacist in their mid to late 20s, like show up on my feed and just want to argue about things. Um, it's, it's just like, it's an unpleasant place to be. And, you know, um, you know, that, uh, that expression, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Yeah. Um, and people often say that to like, talk about members of their family they don't, don't particularly like, even though they're family and they may love them. Uh, that's kind of how I feel about Facebook. Facebook is that family you're stuck with. Um, and Twitter is where my friends are and the people <laughs> I actually want to talk to. Um, and I don't know exactly, I'm, I'm not a social media theorist. I'm not going to talk about my ideas of why this has happened, but um, yeah, ultimately like, we can't be everywhere and not every place is good for us. So this is why I think it's, we turn to one of our articles of faith and we follow the admonition of Paul, right? Mm -hmm. We seek after every good thing. Um, the, I, see, Facebook makes me nervous. There's a Netflix documentary called The Social Dilemma. I've never watched it. I'm probably not going to watch it because it's just going to make me afraid. <laughs> um, and I don't want to be afraid. But I know that there's a lot of emergent kind of accidental behavior that gets baked into algorithms on social media where it tries to group people together and get clicks, right? Yeah. Where um, algorithms that drive engagement can sometimes, and we think we have evidence of this, 
drive a more extreme, start reinforcing extremist views because they get clicks. At first, you're nervous about it, and then maybe you're embracing it, right? <laughs> and it yeah. can, and um, and then of course there's the old rule of the internet, right? Where if you're even vaguely anonymous, you can just be a jerk. <laughs> yeah, and so all of this kind of comes together to make a situation where you have to be careful. Now, what's funny is my kids and the youth that I see, this is their DNA, right? They know this. They know this well. That doesn't mean they're invulnerable to it, right? No. In fact, it possibly the opposite, but yeah. But they know it, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't just say that. Maybe I should say that that maybe that maybe maybe you're maybe you're right maybe that's not true at all well i mean they're so comfortable with it right like they've spent their whole life swimming in these waters and so when they move into the deeper ocean they think that they know everything and that it is their home turf but all of a sudden you know um the biggest the biggest predator you ever saw was a foot long and now the biggest predators are 15 feet long right, this is but the, the thing water that, feels the same this is the thing that i think was missed in those early warnings, right? The warnings aren't stay away from gambling and pornography, although those are both important things to worry about on the internet with young children, right? The, yeah. the things that you have to worry about are radicalization and misinformation. This, I, is, yeah. this is the stuff, this is the soul killer, in my opinion. I hate to say it, Aaron, but the Book of Mormon was right again. Okay, go on. Um, when you design your business to maximize advertising revenue instead of goodness, things don't go well. When you you um, find yourself being sucked into secret combinations, um, government begins to fall apart. And uh, the Book of Mormon, I mean, the Book of Mormon, as far as I know, there is nothing directly in the Book of Mormon about 4chan. And yet, like the principles about um, who do you hang out with and what sort of commitments do you make to your colleagues? And are you focused on, on um, wealth above all other things? Like all these warnings are core to the issues that we have in our country right now. There's hope. There's good news. I don't okay, want, let's have it. I don't want this to be like, um, I, felt, I feel like just now we were going down the rabbit hole of social media is bad. And that's not the message I'm trying, to, trying no, to send. And I don't think so either, but you have to have the tools to navigate it just like yes. you do any other part of life. Go back to episode zero of Face and Hat. Research, oh my goodness. Cien citations, um, scientific answers, and scholarship, right? Cite your sources, you know, you know, do some learning. I love the channel Kirkazot, which we've mentioned so many times on our mess on our show, because every time at the end of one of their videos, they have a document filled with papers, scientific, peer-reviewed publications that tell you all you need to know about it. And if they don't know something, they'll tell you. And they will, and there are two retractions on their channel, right? There's a video on addiction, and there's another video, some kind of civil unrest thing, and they've taken them both down, and they printed, and they put up a video talking about how, the, not that they were wrong, but that it was ill-researched, and that mm. they, what they didn't, they didn't address the subtleties, and it was enough, there were enough problems with it that they, they, they took them down, right? Now, th this is, this is the lesson, this is the kind of this is the kind of living that I that I want that I encourage people to follow. And in every episode of Face and Hat, we have extensive show notes, and we and all of the citations and the um, articles and the quotes and the Twitter threads are all down there at the bottom. Um, and it's and and I'm the one that usually put those together with input from you. And I have to say that I really enjoy that part of the of our hanging out. Doing getting to do scholarship is rewarding in and of itself. Yes, so, although I'd like to be clear that um, you can't just use our show notes and um, 
read those themes and earn your PhD in Mormonism. <laughs> like, they're not that good. <laughs> they're not that. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but, <laughs> they're pretty good. <laughs> they're pretty good. I'm not. I'm not. I, they are. They are um, solid for um, amateurs. And by amateurs, I mean we don't have PhDs in in uh, theology or any such topic. That's right. Um, but for you know, for for a podcast with no sound effects, I'd say they are pretty solid. <laughs> so okay, so that's kind of the the way I wanted to, to take this conversation well, through. And if I could tie it back to the book for a moment, please. Um, this is a mistake we see as as their enthusiasm to get into broadcasting um, is often greater than their research. And then eventually, someone with the appropriate skills and understanding and background um, brings reality back to the conversation. And sometimes yeah. it takes a long time. They stuck with the shortwave theme way longer than they should have, for instance. Yeah. But there was one quote in there. David O. McKay, I think, told um, this president that they hired or these other people they're working with that the goal with these purchases wasn't ever to make money, but to learn how to do how to do it, to yeah. learn about to learn what's going that's going on. Um, so, yeah, I think I agree with you. They but they kind of. Just jumped in, as it were. <laughs> and then but their their goal was to learn. And but well, yeah, they still didn't change. They still did have some things hanging on that took a while to get rid of. Yeah, and something I tell my students all the time, and school does not really reward this behavior, which is why I feel it needs to be said all the time, but the only way to really learn something is to fail. Um, you have to be willing to take some risks and try new things and not succeed in order to actually succeed at some point. I love it. Okay, I'm happy to do a shorter episode. I want to talk about next, the next episode we're going to do, all right? It's Black History yeah. Month, and... We happen to have a book with one of the longest chapters in it, I think, is on the priesthood ban. You know, I learned something this week. Um, and I should say you... it's the ban of um, Black people and African Americans to hold the priesthood. That's what I mean by the right. priesthood ban. That's, that's the one. Um, do you know why Black History Month is in February? No. Although I did see a Twitter joke that it's the shortest month of the year, how annoying that was. Yeah, I, I see that joke every year, um, and it's it's a fine joke, and and it makes a, it raises a reasonable question. But I found out the reason. Um, there was the fellow who came up with the idea actually promoted a Black History Week, and he chose the week in which both Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln's birthdays fall, which is in February, and then that developed into Black History Month. That's why it's February, not because it's the shortest month of the year. I'm very happy to say that that is not the reason. Oh, that's great. Although coincidentally, it is the shortest month of the year. Yeah, this is one of the longest chapters. So I want to just preface this. It's chapter uh, four in the book, um, but we're not experts. We are just going to talk about the chapter and we're just going to see, you know, try to be frank about our own conversations and we'll just see how it goes. That's what we will do. Um, I don't think we're gonna, I mean, how, what, how can I say this? I don't think that, that <laughs> among the many things that we're not experts in, um, racial injustice is probably one of them. <laughs> Certainly not, but I, I definitely wanna say before we even get to it, that we are willing to say that something is racially unjust. I want people to know that they will not come to the next ex episode, um, that you should not come with any expectations that we'll be making excuses or repeating any of the tired, um, debunked and specifically disavowed uh, reasons that were given for it. It was, it was not a good thing. And there's no way to say it is a good thing. And we're just gonna be exploring how David O'McKay like dealt with it. <laughs>